Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's great to see so many of you here. Welcome to the 37th National Pesticide Forum. My name is Sarah Bluer, and I'm the Science and Regulatory Manager at Beyond Pesticides. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here and open up our forum this year. We're going to begin with a panel. And I'm very excited to introduce our speakers to you. This will give you a good introduction to health uh, law and the media and understanding pesticides that you can carry with you through the rest of our forum. So it's great to see you all here, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of the three speakers. Um, so if you just hold on to your questions, we'll have all of them up here in a panel, and they'd be happy to take all of those at the end. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our three panel speakers to the stage. We have Caroline Cox. Melinda Hemmelgarn and Dr. Warren Porter. Thank you. Our first speaker will be Caroline Cox. Caroline is a senior scientist with the Center for Environmental Health in Oakland, California. And she oversees testing of popular consumer products for toxic chemicals and helps promote reduction of these exposures. So we're very excited to have Caroline here, and today she's going to talk to you about 10 reasons not to use pesticides. Welcome, everyone, and my apologies to everyone who's heard this presentation many times in the past. Um, hopefully, you'll learn something new, and hopefully, if you haven't heard it before, it will um, give you a foundation for uh, the rest of the conference. Um, so I'm just going to run through uh, what I came up with as the 10 most important reasons not to use pesticides. Um, and I'm going to do it really fast. So if I confuse you, please um, remember your questions, and I'll be happy to answer them um, in the question period. So the most important thing to remember about pesticides is they don't solve pest problems. And you're all saying, what? I thought that's what they were designed to do, kill pests. Well, yes, it's true, but killing pests doesn't solve pest problems. And just think about it. You all know that if you kill a weed or a mosquito, what's the next thing that happens? Another weed or another mosquito. Um, kind of looking at it, Statistically, if pesticides have been in widespread use since about the um, mid uh, 20th century, and if they really solved pest problems, we wouldn't have to use any more at all, right? Because all the pest problems would be taken care of. Um, in fact, pesticide use has gone down a little bit, but not very much. And um, sometimes uh, you see a reverse pattern. So this is um, glyphosate or Roundup, whose use has absolutely exploded in the last few decades. Um, so how do we actually solve pest problems? Well, what you do is um, you change the conditions that are allowing that pest to thrive. Um, so for a household pest, that can mean Things like screens and caulk that keep pests out, um, doors and escutcheons. If you don't know what an escutcheon is, ask me during the question period. Um, you don't feed the pests. Um, you don't give them the water or moisture that they need to survive. Um, and this um, cleaning um, also removes um, both insects their eggs, and um, the food or water that they need. Um, and then in your garden or in agriculture, it's the same thing. Change the conditions that allow pests to thrive. So um, promote beneficial insects that eat the pests um, using compost, 
to make sure you have a healthy soil that leads to healthy plants. Um, you can choose varieties that do well wherever you are. Um, green manures is another way of building healthy soil. Um, growing diverse crops, crops ro rotations is another important tool. All these things actually prevent problems, solve the pest problems in the long term. Um, the second thing to remember is um, that pesticides are actually hazardous to our health. Given that they're chemicals that are designed to kill, this is not surprising. Um, but sometimes it's really hard to get people to admit that pesticides are bad for our health. Um, this is a quote from EPA, which I just love because EPA doesn't admit that often that pesticides actually cause health problems. Um, and in fact, they've buried it in their archive now. It's no longer um, in the main EPA webpage. Um, and what I'm going to do now is just run through three really commonly used um, pesticides and show you, you know, how this works. Um, and what I'm using for my source of the health hazards caused by each of the pesticides is um, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, Artex database. And the reason I use that is because um, I feel like it's really credible and it's hard for people to argue with it. So um, for the herbicide glyphosate or Roundup, which we use um, you know, almost 300 million pounds a year if you believe EPA estimates, um, there's nine studies in the Artex database showing that it causes genetic damage, four studies showing that it causes um, birth defects, and actually um, the World Health Organization has identified it as a cancer-causing chemical. Um, chlorpyrifos, which um, has been the most commonly used insecticide in the U.S., about six million pounds a year. Um, the NIOSH database gives 27 studies that it causes genetic damage and 14 studies showing that it damages um, the developing nervous system. That means your brain. Um, and chlorothalonil, which is probably the most commonly used fungicide, about 11 million pounds per year according to EPA. So we have 10 studies that it damages genes, one study that it affects fertility, one study that it causes birth defects, and one study showing that it causes cancer. So moving right along, um, another important reason not to use pesticides is that they cause special problems for children. Um, so kids eat and drink a lot for their size. They roll on carpets and roll around on the lawn. They're also growing and developing so that they're more susceptible to the damage caused by pesticides. Pesticides also contaminate our food. Um, and um, every year, the USDA does a survey of pesticide residues on certain uh, food items. This is their most recent data. Um, over half of the items that they tested did have pesticide residues. And um, over a quarter of those had residues of more than one pesticide. So um, it's really common. And um, I always like to pick out a few surprising things. So believe it or not, 94% of the grapefruits they tested had at least one pesticide. And um, in this study, they prepare the food as you would prepare it to eat it. So these are not just in the peel. It's in the part that you eat. Um, kale, our favorite healthy vegetable, 95% the kale samples had at least one pesticide. Um, something that's really, really important is that pesticides are especially a problem for farmers and farm workers um, who are on the front lines of pesticide exposure. Um, so there's a couple of studies that in the last few decades have really demonstrated this. Um, the Chamaco study um, from uh, the University of California um, has been working with farm worker families um, in California for the last couple of decades, and they've demonstrated links between a whole range of um, 
health problems um, and uh, pesticide exposure, um, particularly pesticide exposure to pregnant moms causing problems for their kids later on. Um, one recent study they did that I just um, really uh, took note of is um, they had a group of teens uh, wearing those silicon wristbands that have become um, sort of a, a common new way of measuring your exposure to chemicals. Um, and they found that these teens were exposed to a lot of different pesticides, not surprisingly, but two that appeared to be related to agricultural use. Um, that was the herbicide Dacthol and the insecticide permethrin. So um, we're just learning more and more about how these chemicals affect farm workers. Um, as far as farmers, there's a federal study called the Agricultural Health Study that's been looking at um, the relationship between pesticide use and um, health problems in farmers for the last couple decades. Again, they found a string of things that um, are linked to pesticide use. Um, the newest one I saw in a paper that was just published, um, they found an association between use of alicor, which you may have never heard of. It's a herbicide that's um, commonly used on corn um, and cancer of the vocal cords. Now, who would have ever thought, you know? And um, without these kind of studies, we would never know um, this kind of information. Um, so um, another thing I think that speaks to some people really in a really compelling way is that pesticides are hazardous to health, uh, hazardous to pets. Um, uh, they're acutely poisonous to pets. In fact, um, the um, Pet Poison Control Center says um, insecticides are number eight on the top 10 list of what poisons pets and rodenticides, that's a fancy name for rat poison, are number seven. Um, uh, they also affect pets in um, sort of long-term chronic health problems. This is a really old study, but one of my favorites that um, uh, Scottish Terriers that um, live in houses where the lawn is treated with herbicides have an increased risk of um, bladder cancer. Um, again, who would have thought? And if we didn't have scientists doing these kind of studies, we would never know. Um, pesticides really often contaminate water um, and um, in the late 90s and early 2000s, the uh, U.S. Geological Survey did kind of a national survey of pesticides in um, streams and rivers across the U.S. Um, unfortunately, they haven't done any of that kind of national survey recently, but I don't think the data has changed. What they said, if you look at streams they sampled, more than 90% of the time they found pesticides in streams. And this is across the country, you know, from Florida to Maine to California to Washington and everywhere in between. Um, pesticides are also hazardous to um, wildlife, um, other living things, fish, birds, and bees. Um, I'm gonna go back to those three really common pesticides that I talked about earlier. Um, and these are just statements from the label um, of these uh, pesticide products. So again, I think um, nobody can really argue with it. So, um, you know, Roundup, it says on the label, do not apply directly to water. And the reason for that is because the product is toxic to things that live in the water. Um, chlorpyrifos, it says, toxics to fish, aquatic invertebrates, that means little water animals, small mammals, birds, and highly toxic to bees. Um, watch out. Um, chlorthalonil, um, even though this is you know, supposed to be something for plant diseases, but it's actually, again, toxic to little water animals and also to wildlife. Um, so I have to stop here in my rush to get through my presentation and just um, mention that um, uh, we gotta take a minute to think about Rachel Carson. So, um, you know, 
in, in more ways than one, she is the reason why we're all here. Um, and it was really her concern about birds that led her to study pesticides. And um, it, I don't know if any of you have read Silent Spring lately, but um, she addresses every issue that we talk about when we talk about pesticides. And except she was writing in, you know, 1960. And it's everything she says is pretty much is still relevant. Um, a really um, foresighted uh, woman. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I think are really crucial um, and maybe a little harder to um, understand. But people often say, well, pesticides must be okay because um, doesn't the government test them or approve them or something? And um, pesticide companies will often say, like, approved by EPA or something like that. Um, so here's um, the sad truth. Um, our national pesticide law doesn't say that the government has to test pesticides and make sure they're okay. Um, uh, in fact, um, health and safety testing is delegated to pesticide companies. So here's what you have. Um, who profits from the sale of pesticides? these big pesticide companies and a whole lot of small ones. And um, who's doing the testing? These same companies. Um, so um, if you ever had a you know, sort of classic case of the fox guarding the hen house, um, this, you know, this is it. Um, and I, I, I just got a new pesticide paper um, in my email this morning, and they were looking at um, genetic damage caused by, um, actually by glyphosate, Roundup. And they compared the studies done by the pesticide company uh, versus studies done by independent scientists. 2% um, of the pesticide company studies showed that glyphosate caused, caused genetic damage um, about 80% of the independent studies showed that it caused damage. So, you know, that's what we're looking at. Um, and then um, the last of my 10 reasons is that pesticides have too many secrets. What do I mean by this? Well, um, if you wanted to know uh, what was sprayed uh, in your neighbor's yard or um, in your neighborhood park, or your kid's school, um, or the side of the road where you drive every day, more than likely you would have a really hard time finding out that information. And if you wanted to know when the applications were made and what product was used and how much, you maybe could get that information if you worked really, really hard at it, um, but it's not you know, easily available. And the irony is, even if you did all that work and you got that information, you still wouldn't know what you were exposed to um, because virtually every pesticide product in the country has um, secret ingredients. They're usually referred to as inert or other ingredients. Um, they're not identified on the label, and the companies claim they're trade secrets. So there's, in fact, no way for you to know what you're exposed to or what your kids are exposed to. Okay. Um, I um, made a promise to my fellow panelists that I would, having gone through all the bad news, um, give you some good news to take away with you. <laughs> um, so. Um, there was a recent survey where they asked people, um, you know, do you buy organic food? And 82% of Americans said yes. That's incredible. Um, now, they all, you know, all 82% of us need to buy more, right? Um, but still, that's huge. And um, the even better news is that it didn't change a lot depending on your income. So 
lower income people were as um, likely to buy organic food as um, middle or higher income folks. Um, so um, that, I mean, we are making progress. It may not seem that way, but it is happening. Um, so we don't need these poisons and thank you very much. That was so great. I'm convinced not to use pesticides. Our next speaker will be Melinda Hemelgarn. Melinda is an award-winning uh, writer, investigative dietitian, and host of Food Sleuth Radio in Columbia, Missouri. With 30 years of experience in clinical, academic, and public health nutrition, Melinda is a trusted consumer advocate and promoter of food system literacy. And today, she'll be talking about media's influence on uh, what we know and think about pesticides, and also, to keep it positive at the end, how to take back that narrative. So without further ado, please welcome Melinda. And I will apologize for the delay set up. With a little bit of further ado. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, please welcome Melinda. Thank you. So nice to have tech help. Thank you so much. It's so great to see all of you here. Thank you for coming to this conference and for caring about this issue. You know, I got involved in media literacy and I was trained in media literacy after I was working on childhood obesity issues and realizing that there was, there had to be some sort of invisible force going on. You know, why is it that children said they liked pizza most, but their favorite restaurant was McDonald's? So there was this disconnect there was a lot of influence in media. And you know there's a lot of influence in media when it comes to how we think about pesticides as well. So we care about media because it frames how we think and how we act. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have a crash course in media literacy and um, I'm gonna try to keep it to 20 minutes. So I really love this quote by former Federal Communications Chairman Reed Hunt. What he said was, the media's significance and clout comes from its near ubiquitous, pervasive power to completely alter the belief of every American. Think about that. We swim in so many media messages. And the thing is, we don't think that they affect us because we think we're smarter than that. You know, we're not going to be duped. But actually, if you look at some of the research, this is from uh, the War on Bugs. This is Will Allen, the Will Allen that's in Vermont. He did a great book uh, looking at the pesticide marketing and advertising. And um, there's a quote in there from a woman with the Pesticide Action Network, and she said that, you know, Dr. Seuss, before he wrote Red Fish, Blue Fish, and Green Eggs and Ham, he was working as a cartoonist for the pesticide industry. And that one cartoon campaign increased pesticide use tenfold for the nation's families. I mean, people would, marketing companies would not be spending millions of dollars if it didn't work. So what we have to understand about media is that it both creates and reflects culture. So where I live, you open up a farming magazine and these are the kind of images we get. The message is that it's man against weeds, man against nature, and we've got tools or weapons to fight back. We're not saying, gosh, how can we work with nature? It's this man is in charge, man is in control of nature. Here's something from the soybean growers, attack of the super weeds. What are we going to do? We're going to defend ourselves. It's a war. So I need to tell you where I live. Uh, I'm originally from New York and it's great to be back. Um, but I live where that little green star is on that map in the state of Missouri. And uh, if you can see, we're, you know, we're typically called the flyover zone. 
Uh, you could also call us the spray over zone. You can call us a sacrifice zone, if you will. But this is the corn and soybean belt. And you think, well, that doesn't affect me. But any processed food that you pick up in the supermarket anywhere contains likely either corn or soy or both. And this is where it's grown. The vast majority of it is genetically engineered to resist the spraying of glyphosate or Roundup. And what happens is weeds develop resistance. And because they're developing resistance, what's happening is that the pesticide companies are developing resistance to additional herbicides. So this is a river that I love. Um, it's the Gasconade River. I have raised my family there. I have kayaked, swam. You know, we've, we've looked at the wildlife. We listened to the river run. And I feel like I have a moral obligation to protect this water. It's my watershed. This is the Mississippi River watershed. It's the fourth lar largest river shed in the world. And it is, as Carolyn explained, one of all of the river shed, the watersheds that we have that is contaminated with pesticides. We even have glyphosate in our rainwater because of the water cycle. So my job as a dietitian is to help people eat well. How do I do that? I do it through education, I do it through advocacy, and I do it through translation, translating research to make it applicable for everyday consumers. The problem is I do this in this sea of increasing misinformation, disinformation, really successful tools of persuasion to teach us or veer us away from the truth. And so what do we do in this environment of fake news and truth decay? We need to be media literate. We need to know how to navigate this media environment so that we can find what's right for us. So uh, I found this, what I thought was a quote from Mark Twain. Mark Twain, by the way, is from Missouri. Um, the quote that was attributed to him was, it's easier to fool people than it is to convince them that they've been fooled. Think about that for a minute. It's easier to fool people than it is to convince them that they've been fooled because then you have to, you have to, you know, you have to save face because you've been duped. Now I will say that I showed this slide to my son and he said, are you sure that Mark Twain said that? I was like, oh good, I've taught him well. And as it turns out, this, this is attributed to Mark Twain, but we can't find evidence that he ever really said it. Regardless, um, you know, so even, even those of us who are trained in media literacy still get tricked. But uh, I really love the quote, and I like Mark Twain, so there, there we have it. So who makes these media messages? Well, public relations companies are very successful, and I pulled two media, uh, excuse me, public relations companies that work in the food and agriculture space. The first is Porter Novelli, the second is Ketchum. Listen to what they say about what they do. Porter Novelli. We motivate people to change deeply ingrained behaviors rooted in cultural and social norms. Our results are greater than influencing people. We make them believe. This is what people do at public relations companies. They make us believe the message. Ketch, uh, Ketchum, who works in the food space, what they say is, we help food executives build trust and enhance the bottom line. And you can get, this is right off their website. So the Ag Web, this is powered by the Farm Journal, Journal. They worked with a public relations firm to come up with this trust in food campaign. And what are they gonna do? Well, they are gonna, this is what they say, they're gonna use highly immersive engagements to educate and change perceptions and behaviors. So every time the environmental working group comes out with their clean 15 and dirty dozen list, we hear this, oh my gosh, don't believe it. So here is a tweet that was posted by a registered dietitian who works for the supermarket industry. And this is what she said. Did you see the dirty dozen list? Don't believe it for a minute. Here are the facts. Hashtag facts, not fear. Those of us who are concerned about pesticides, and rightfully so, are often called fear mongers. Keep, the, keep these terms in mind, trust, fear mongering. And here you have um, a, a promotion from the Alliance for Food and Farming, and we'll get to them later. They say, moms deserve the truth. You bet they do. Use facts, not fear, 
to make unhealthy to make healthy food choices. So, what are the persuasive techniques that are used against our our better thinking? So the first, I'm just going to go through a few of them. There is a handout outside that has a longer list of persuasive tactics. But whether you're selling milk or pesticides or automobiles or politicians, the same persuasive techniques are, techniques are used to influence us. So for example, simple, easy solutions. I mean, we're human beings. Who doesn't want the easy way out? The second is something like a testimonial. And the testimonial is either delivered by somebody who's famous, who we aspire to be like, or it could be somebody who looks just like us. So here we have a, this, if you go to Missouri and you meet a farmer, that's what they're gonna look like. If he's using that chemical, I might, I might as well too. He says it's easy. This is Ivana Trump. I, you know, I keep magazines for a long time and I found a 1996 copy of, I think, a Bon Appetit and Ivana was selling milk. But this is an example of a celebrity kind of selling something. Emotion, here's a billboard that was in the Washington DC airport. Talk about fear mongering. Oh my God, nine billion people, now what are we gonna do? Well, we've gotta use, clearly Monsanto has the answer, they've got their little logo on there. We've gotta use modern agriculture, high tech solutions for feeding the world. And then there's nostalgia. And aren't we familiar with one of the most successful nostalgic campaigns, Make America Great Again? It's a brilliant campaign. Everyone is doing it, bandwagoning. You know, you don't want to, people don't want to be left out from the crowd. We all, I remember when I was in seventh grade, I wanted to have go-go boots because all my other friends had it. It's the same thing, we don't want to be left out. And then scientific support. So remember, you know, this, is, this may or may not be a doctor. He's a man in a white lab coat. He's saying he's a doctor and he's, he's supporting a cigarette brand. And now we have someone who appears to be a scientist telling us that herbicides are scientifically supported. If you open up farm journal, you will see men who look just like farmers in my region. And what are they saying? I will use multiple herbicides to fight back weed resistance. Not only are my friends and family using these, my community is, I don't want to be talked about at the coffee shop, but these are new and modern and advanced techniques. So it's sort of like if you just use Roundup or glyphosate, it's like using a snow shovel. But if you use Roundup combined with dicamba, then that's like using a snowblower. That's, that's the modern advanced technique. Modern, but still connected with mother nature. And this is a, an, an ad from Monsanto. This is a lovely ad, and I love the artistic uh, way that they did this, showing the old-fashioned, you know, grandpa did it this way, but now we're moving to a more modern technique with the color change. And this is in list. These are, these are seeds that are resistant to both glyphosate and 2,4-D. Emotion, look at this. She's just the apple of his eye, and the ad says, this is also for enlist, protecting what's really important with Enlist. Farmers, uh, they, they don't like to have dirty fields. So when fields have weeds in them, they, that's termed dirty. So this ad is focusing on, well, you don't want to plant in a dirty field, so you've got to use the herbicide to get rid of those weeds. Who doesn't want to make more money, right? Farmers are struggling now. And so here's a solution. And the solution is going to increase yield, increase profit. Perfect fruit. I go to my farmer's market and even there farmers tell me, oh, I don't want to sell any produce that doesn't look exactly perfect. So how do you get there? Well, we got sprays for that. You will often hear this, this phrase, feeding the world. And in fact, if you look in farming magazines, you can get belt buckles and even guns with that message of farmers are feeding the world, but not in Yemen. So with media literacy, what we need to do is think critically. That's really what media literacy is all about. How do we do that? Well, we need to know certain, we need to answer certain questions. We need to know who owns the ad. Who's going to profit from that message? And Spinning Food is a fabulous publication by the Friends of the Earth that goes through a lot of these uh, companies, how much money they earn. We'll see them here in a bit. Who delivers the message and why? Think about that. Are they white? Are they black? Are they young? Are they old? Everything is scripted. 
Identify the persuasive techniques that we talked about and that are on the handout for you in the lobby. And then start asking those critical questions. What's missing from that message? What are the alternatives? Have they all been explored? And what are the unintended consequences? What are the effects on pollinators? What are the effects on non-target species? What are the effects on our food? What about our children? Is it safe to swim in that river? Well, I was driving through northern Arkansas and I saw this sign that looked like a pretty professionally made sign. It said, farmers need dicamba. And there's actually been a fight in Arkansas. There are some farmers who say, yeah, we need this to fight back the pigweed, which is a resistant weed to glyphosate. And there are other farmers who are saying no, because it's killing everything else that it's drifting on. So this is a gentleman that I just interviewed, Richard Coy. He's in no he was in northeastern Arkansas. He is having to move his 10,000 beehives down to uh, the Mississippi Gulf, where there is no dicamba spraying. What's the problem? Dicamba drifts. And it is drifting on some of the native plants that are nourishing his bees. He's lost so many hives that he needs to move. So he's moving to two places, actually. He and his brother, they, it's a family business. They're going to the Mississippi Gulf, and they're going to uh, the northern, like just under the Canadian border in, I think he said, North Dakota. So I got to thinking about some of the maps that I've seen. So there's the map of the glyphosate use. And then I thought, you know, I saw this map of wild bee abundance from the University of Vermont. And I thought, you know, those patterns are really similar. So everywhere where there's yellow is low bee abundance, wild bee abundance. And everywhere that's blue, you've got high bee abundance. And so, you know, I think we have to ask questions like, is there a connection between these chemicals and the loss of our insects? Now, the University of Missouri, um, there's a weed scientist there who, is, ha who has graduate students looking at this driftable fac fractions of dicamba. And you can see what's happening to a peach tree with different levels of drift. So if we don't have peach trees, we don't have peaches. Can you imagine not having a summer with a fresh peach? This is quality of life. So, but here's the thing. Farmers are getting an incentive to use the herbicide that combines glyphosate and dicamba. So it's a real problem in that the farmers make more money, but at what cost? And it's not just peaches. It's nut trees. It's the trees that we love that give us shade. It's grapes. It's tomatoes. It's garlic. And so we have seen extensive drift damage throughout the Midwest. In fact, there was a great report from the Union of Concerned Scientists that talked about how many trillions of dollars we could save if we just ate more of the kinds of foods that dicamba drift is killing. These are medically important foods that we're killing. So media literacy, language matters. To change people's thinking, we have to change the language that they use. That was spoken by Eddie Ellis, who was a former Black Panther. He was in the interview in the Sun Magazine in July 2013. Start thinking about the kind of language that we connect with things. So we heard about modern agriculture. Well, gosh, organic agriculture is modern, and we need to start putting those words together. It's modern agriculture, it's organic. Pesticides, they're kind of a nasty word, so the industry calls it crop protection. That sounds a lot nicer. Crop protection is biodiversity, not pesticides. Chemlon didn't change any formulas, but they just changed their name to True Green. And then the National Agricultural Chemicals Association changed their name to Crop Life America. Crop Life America has free curriculum that goes into schools, and teaches children, right? It's easier, to, it's easier to be fooled than to change somebody's thinking that's already been established. So get them young. Go into the schools. This looks like fear mongering to me because it's telling kids that if we don't use herbicides, that pests can kill three fourths of a farmer's crop. And feeding planet Earth, well, what, what child wouldn't want that? It's a good thing. They're sensitive using modern agriculture. When Dow and DuPont uh, merged, they formed a company called Corteva. Where does that word come from? Well, um, Kristen Schaefer at the Pesticide Action Network in North America actually forwarded me this information. She said what they did was they took heart from Latin and nature from Hebrew, 
and they combined it to form Corteva. And then they talk about it. Well, this is a company that's committed to growing progress. Farms and farmers flourish. We're moving our world forward. These are all good things. I talked about spinning food, and I just want you to like make a note to check this out. It's online. This was from 2013, this, this data, but there's actually information from, um, I think, 2015 now. But you can go in and you can see, oh, who, who funds U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance? Who's really behind those messages? So you can go in and you can see how many millions they've spent between you know, so many years, and then you can see who's funding them. This is a magazine, Today's Dietitian, that is uh, focused on dietitians. They had a multi-page advertorial by Monsanto teaching us the facts about food and farming. And you know, I had been invited to speak at the Today's Dietitian Conference until I called them on this advertorial, and then I wasn't anymore. So there is a price to speaking out. But you've got to know who the messenger is, and people deserve that. And for dietitians, you know, our focus is promoting public health. It is unethical for us to be in relationship with these companies that are poisoning our children and, and contaminating our water. What about university affiliations? You know, we have a Monsanto auditorium and a Monsanto uh, business park. Do you think there's influence there? This is a land-grant college, and it's not just the University of Missouri. You go to any land-grant college, there might be a Cargill Auditorium. You know, all of the big industries have connections to the ag schools. So, positive, how do we take back the narrative? Well, Dave Vetter is an organic farmer, and he's struggling in Nebraska because of drift issues. All of, con all of the contamination is up to Dave to present. He's got to have the buffer, not the conventional farmer that's using the chemicals. So he has a sign on his place. It says, how your food is produced does matter. That's good. The pesticide-free zone for sale in the lobby. I have one of these in my garden right up front because when I, I want people who walk by to see my beautiful native flowers and to say, wow, you can have flowers like that and not use pesticides? That's good. And then there's the Audubon. You know, the Audubon Foundation, these are wonderful people who are concerned about bird habitat. So isn't it great when we can partner with other organizations and foundations that support this network and to support protecting what really matters in our lives, the environment. Social media, just like social media is used against us in getting negative messages out, we can use it to promote positive things. And you know, there, science is great, it's really important, but we have to have it combined with art because art is what touches the heart. And we, we're not gonna change our policies and our minds unless we're also changing our heart. How do we do that? April is National Poetry Month, just saying. There's music, there's documentary film, there are political cartoons that I actually received via Twitter that I forwarded via social media. So here's a guy, I don't know if you can see it, it you know, describes the insect apocalypse where he's got insects all over the windshield in 1998. And then he doesn't have insects on the, wind, in, on the windshield in 2018, he's pretty happy about that. And then in 2028, he's no longer there. Matt Willey, oh my gosh, I was driving through LaBelle, Florida, and I see this beautiful mural on this building. I said, we gotta stop. Go inside, we find out who it is, Matt Willey is painting 50,000 honeybees all over buildings in, in, throughout the world. This is his mission. And we were hoping he was going to be here, but he's actually working on a project in the southeast. He lives in Asheville. Um, but if you go to 50 Rockefeller Plaza, you can see on the window of anthropology some of his bees. The bee on the right is painted on a barn roof in Lyons, Nebraska. He was hoping that the crop dusters might kind of think about the bees that were down there when they were flying over the field. And then Robert Shetterly, an artist, he had been a surrealist until 20, uh, excuse me, until 9-11, and he said, I gotta do something. So we started painting portraits. And with the portraits, he does interviews. And then he promotes people who are working for social and environmental justice and civil rights. And he exhibits all over the country. So here you can see Rachel Carson. And the pull quote was, the control of nature is a phrase conceived in, the arrogant, in arrogance, born of the Neanderthal age of biology, 
and the convenience of man. And so they have cards that you can mail out and get these out. Um, and then, of course, Joan Gussow, who we'll be hearing from later this afternoon. She was also painted by Robert Shetterly. It's the Americans Who Tell the Truth Project. You take a look at it online and plan to spend a couple of hours. It's wonderful. Um, this is a project I worked on with my husband called Farm Food Art Revolution Media. He's a great photographer. He did the photographs. I did the interviews. And then what we wanted to do is have these note cards. And we had, along with the beautiful image, we had a little nugget from what the farmer or the food producer said. So in this case, this is Sini Burhanu. She's originally from Ethiopia. She lives in St. Louis. And she said, I use organic ingredients because I want to make food that's good for humanity. Using media to get messages out that support good public health. Food Sleuth Radio, we are in our 10th year. Um, if you're not tuned in, you can go to KOPN.org. You can listen anytime, also through PRX. This is amplifying the voices that are not heard. So each voice, each person that's interviewed is a piece of a puzzle. And they connect the dots between food health and agriculture, and then we amplify their voices all over the country. And you can see some of my favorite organic advocates right there. Just a sampling. We've done over 500 interviews. So remember uh, when I told you that media both creates and reflects what's going on in our culture and in our society? Pay attention to what's on billboards. Pay attention to the flyers that are stuck up that say, we're having a fish fry to raise money for little Johnny who can't afford treatment for his brain cancer. I've started to collect these images because it's very interesting. I mean, this is the little girl here from the Muppets. You know, when my kids were little, there wasn't an autistic character. But now there is. As of 2015, there's a four-year-old Julia who has autism. I was really blown away when I opened up the Missouri Hospital Association magazine and I saw that they were building MRIs that looked like sandcastles so that that would reduce the um, anxiety in kids with cancer who were going through a screening. So our environment is changing and media is telling us that, but we have to pay attention. So last slide. Thank you, and remember, we are stronger together, and that's why we're here. Thank you. Thank you so much for that inspiring talk and very informative. So just an announcement. Um, you may have all noticed there are note cards in the middle of your tables. Those are actually for writing down questions. So the way we're going to take questions after the panel is we'll have you raise your note cards um, after Warren speaks, and then we'll repeat those questions up here for our panelists. So as you listen to the last talk, and after that, just jot down a few of your questions. So I'm just going to set up. Great. So our final speaker on this panel. I'm honored to introduce Dr. Warren Porter. Warren is a professor emeritus of zoology and environmental toxicology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Dr. Porter investigates pesticide exposure effects on neurological immune and endocrine function. And today, he's going to talk to us about PGMO and pesticide implications for human health and he'll teach us that little things mean a lot. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Porter. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm just going to get right into this. <clears throat> First thing I want to point out to you is that we are all slow pollinators. And what I mean by that is we have long lifespans, 20 to 25 years before our genome gets turned over to the next generation. But bees do it in a single summer or a lot less than that. And so the ability to respond to change and disturbance is very, very different for us than it is for uh, shorter-lived organisms. And one of the questions I keep asking is, are we facing a colony collapse disorder too? Before I get to that, I want to ask you a question. What do magicians, pickpockets, the current administration, and PGMOs have in common? The answer to that is distraction, so you can't see what's really going on. 
One more question, why did saccharin cause cancer? Be it didn't, it was the traces of the solvent used in its manufacture that caused the cancer. And that brings me to one of the main themes of this talk, little things mean a lot. And one of the things that fo follow from that is our body's chemicals work in the parts per trillion to parts per quadrillion. That's the concentration that we have circulating in our body. That's equivalent to taking all the water in 20 Olympic pools, dropping a single eyedropper of, of the material into that f volume of fluid, and now you're talking parts per trillion or parts per quadrillion. Today, I can only have time to show you a little tip of the iceberg. Things aren't always what they seem, and I have a favorite story about old Charlie driving the New York freeway out here uh, last fall, and his wife calls him on the cell phone. He answered it, and she says, Charlie, Charlie, be careful. There's some idiot on the freeway driving the wrong way, and I don't want you to get hurt. He says, what do you mean one? He says, there's hundreds of them. <laughs> so today, I want to very briefly uh, look at how everything is interconnected. I want to consider basic principles, a few basic principles, because I'm going to show you data, and I want you to make your own conclusions about these data, and I want you to understand how to make those connections. So we're going to talk about common pesticide mixtures, how they can modify all those things listed there, and finally, safe, effective, inexpensive solutions to these problems. Example number one, the endocrine system. We now have a situation that started and made public really in 1992 when Elizabeth Carlson and Neil Skakabach in Denmark discovered that Danish men had very, very low sperm counts relative to what they thought they should be having, and it's certainly compared to what they had way back in the 30s and 40s. Um, that generated a whole suite of papers, probably at least a couple hundred, people said, this can't be true. But in fact, <clears throat> those yellow circles there, which were the global data for everything up until the time of that first uh, paper by Elizabeth Carlson, uh, showed that it was happening in Denmark, it was happening in France, the red ones. Um, everything was going down at about 2 to 3% per year, and it was not only the quantity of the sperm, but also the quality of the sperm that was shrinking because that right barrier there refers to two blue triangles in there, one in 1980 where about 50% of the sperm were normal and then 10 years later when only 25% of the sperm were normal. And what I mean by normal is they have one head and one tail instead of a head and no tail or a tail and no head or two tails and all kinds of stuff like that. Also, I want to point out to you that 60 to 70 percent of the U.S. males in the mid-30s, late and early 40s qualified as sperm donors. And by 1990, we were down to 6 to 7 percent of U.S. males qualifying. Uh, in 2012, only 1 percent of the Israeli soldiers who are the prime sperm donors for Israel were, would qualify as sperm donors. And a year later, the U.S. Census Bureau announced that by golly, this is the first year ever that U.S. whites had more deaths than births, but that was covered up by increasing the immigration rate. In April of uh, 2017, one in eight couples were having fertility problems. And here is something that is really crucial and central to this whole endocrine thing, uh, and it has many ramifications. Most people don't realize that we were all conceived and developed in our early embryology as bisexual organisms. We have a male and a female reproductive tract, a very crude one, that stays there until about a third of the way through your development. And at that point, the fetus looks at the ratio of testosterone, the male hormone, versus estrogen, the female hormone. If the testosterone is higher, that embryo is going to develop into a more male-like organism, no matter what its genetics is. If the estrogen level is higher, it's going to be the other way around. It's going to be female in its inclinations and its sexual behavior and it's in, in, its, in its development of its phenotype, no matter whether it's genetically male or female. This is something that most people don't realize. 
but it's a very important concept to conceptual understanding that you need because now all of a sudden the kinds of things that we are seeing now in terms of sexual behavior and sexual development and sperm production capabilities illustrated by this graph, all of a sudden they're all interconnected. And now we discover Roundup and Atrazine, those two of the most important and most frequently used herbicides, each of them are capable of altering the balance of testosterone and estrogen. And that's because, and we'll talk about why that is. They interfere with a particular enzyme that converts testosterone in a one-way conversion to estrogen. And it's the only time, uh, the only way that estrogen is made is coming through testosterone. Example number two, instead of endocrine now, we're talking neurological. And these are the data shown in Martin Boudot's film, Toxic Chemicals, Are Kids in Danger? Way on the left down there, you see the births in 1975 was one in 5,000 births was autistic. And by 2014, it was one in 68. And a year later, the estimates from the surveys were one in 45. That curve is not leveling out yet. And now a third system. We've had the endocrine, the neurological, and now the immune system. Chronic inflammation on the right-hand side of this. The left side is diseases that are caused by various uh, organisms that we can raise uh, vaccines against. But the right side is chronic inflammation. This is driven by chronic inflammation. We're talking asthma, type 1 diabetes, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, and that's only a few of the 10 chronic diseases that are exploding in our human populations, not only here in the US, but in the, across the world. And as a side comment, the current administration is defunding the highly successful WHO program for early containment of highly infectious diseases like Ebola. So we've got compromises of immune function not only from pesticides, apparently, but also from the various medications that we are taking in terms of fixing our aching bellies or a number of other kinds of relatively minor things. You don't see this every day, but if you watch those ads very carefully, right near the end, there are all these disclaimers. Oh, don't take this if you've got tuberculosis or a whole suite of other possible infectious diseases because what they're really doing is they're also suppressing your immune function. And so all of a sudden now we've got a population, a very significant portion of our population that's being immunosuppressed. And we've got these conditions where all kinds of diseases are also arising. Here's the theory that connects all of these different phenomena and helps you understand why any kind of pesticide is going to have substantial and varied and diverse effects. And I'm going to give you one example of that in the context of Roundup a little bit in a moment. On the left-hand half of this figure, where we're looking at the theory of how everything is interconnected, we see at the bottom two triangles, one on the left, which is about cellular molecular processes that are driven by mass and energy, the chemicals that make them up. That's what runs and fuels our operations. That's what we're going to have for supper tonight. And then those cellular molecular organism systems are put together into things like the central nervous system on the right the lower triangle there, uh, the endocrine system and the immune system. Those three can, uh, organ systems talk to each other all the time. There's a coffee clutch going on between all three of them. There's about 60 different chemicals they use to communicate with each other. And we'll talk about the importance of those in just a moment. But what they do is those two bottom triangles support the upper levels of the individual variation uh, and the individual functions of reproduction, growth, and And another one that I can't read right now. <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, yes. And then we've got um, the populations, birth rates, death rates, uh, social structure. And then finally, at the community level, way at the top, we've got 
relative species abundance, immigration, immigration rates. The, what this you know, illustration is trying to show you is when we start introducing pesticides and eroding the foundations that support those two bottom triangles, we are undermining the entire s structures that support that superstructure above it. And so if we do that, the whole superstructure has the tendency to collapse if we don't maintain those, that support system underneath. And I want to point out, too, that, that nervous endocrine immune system, these all are systems that have been shown to respond more significantly to lower doses rather than higher doses. The lower you go, in other words, the greater the effect in many of these experimental situations. Also, the gut is part of the immune system. In fact, it's a critical part of the immune system. It's about 70% of your immune function, the bacteria in the gut. And so that's very important. We're going to talk about that some more. And then finally, we have the genetic expression of the organism itself, which drives your cellular molecular processes. And if you interfere with that, it's turning out that environmental contaminants and pesticides are capable of hacking the system, of interfering with the communication and the instructions that are being sent from the genetic apparatus so that you no longer have that normal function. And now all of a sudden you begin to appreciate how we can see so many different kinds of effects coming from similar kinds of directions and the reasons for those changes in direction. I also want to point out that all of these superstructures and, and the foundations here are based on beneficial soil microbiomes. Without the proper soil microbiomes, we're not going to grow any kind of decent food, and that's a lot of what uh, organic agriculture is all about. But if we introduce Roundup, all of a sudden now we've added to the soil an agent that is capable of stopping the ability of bacterium to produce a suite of proteins that they need to survive. We don't need that as mammals in our bodies, except that it turns out the bacteria in our gut definitely need those, back, those pathways. So by introducing these kind of chemicals in our foods and interfering with the ability of our uh, gut bacteria to survive, they don't survive. And the presence of Roundup then exterminates both the soil and the gut microbiomes in important and significant ways. I also want to talk very briefly about basic principles. Why do chemicals get into our body, and why is it that they can exact so many different kinds of tolls? <clears throat> Part of the reason for this is the other ingredients, the inert ingredients, which are solvents and surfactants. And the lower part of this figure here uh, <clears throat> shows a cross-section through a leaf. The top of the leaf is there on top, and there's a big red arrow pointing downward. Those are solvents that allow things to dissolve in through the top waxy surface of the leaf and get to the inside where they can kill the plant. The alternative way of entering the plant, instead of going through the skin, is through the respiratory system, that hole in the bottom that has a little hem hemispherical uh, bit of water, the surface tension of water. That's a physical barrier. But when you put surfactants in there, all of a sudden now you get rapid penetration through that uh, surface. Now up on the top half, it shows you that unfortunately we are the same kind of construction as plants and other animals. Have you ever thought about why you don't dissolve when it rains on you? It's because your waxy surface on the outside. Your skin is a waxy surface. You see it every time you take a shower. Your skin beads up with the water. Now, um, the other thing is your lungs. Your lungs are like that respiratory system down below. Every tiny little sac in your lungs of alveolus is lined with a thin film of water. And there's a surfactant in there a little bit, but you add more and all of a sudden you've got greater penetration. So you can be intoxicated with a pesticide just by lying on the grass, it's treated, or having it wind blow it to your skin and it lands on your skin, or you can breathe it in. You don't have to eat anything or drink anything. You get it right through your skin. 
and it will go right to your brain. The interesting thing about all of this is these so-called inert ingredients, which are solvents and surfactants, are not part of the EPA registration process. And what they test is something completely different, only the active ingredient. What they sell you, what they sell you is that mix, which means that we have functionally a bait and switch registration process by the EPA. And we'll talk a lot more about that later. Now lately, it's turned out there's another inert ingredient suite of chemicals that hadn't been appreciated until recently, although there had been some indications back in the 70s that this was going on, and that is that there are all kinds of heavy metals being added as other ingredients. It's toxic waste from other industries that are being added. In, the case, in this case, we're talking arsenic, cadmium, cobalt, uh, chromium, nickel, and lead. These are all outlined in that paper cited right there. Now, I want to show you one more thing and, and talk about two basic principles, and then we will have the foundations laid for understanding how pesticides can impact your health and that of your children or your parents even. Um, how do you design a pesticide first? That's in the upper right-hand part of the figure here where we've got a ring-shaped structure, that nitrogen, uh, nitrogen, nitrogen, and there's carbons between them. It has essentially no charges on it, it no, no static electricity. That makes it lipid-soluble or fat-soluble. And then what you do is you hang off of that um, ring-shaped structure various groups that have electrostatic charges. For illustration here, I've just put a nitrogen and two hydrogens, which gives it a positive charge. So we, the positive, positive charge makes it water soluble. So you got a molecule that dissolves in fats, but it also dissolves in water. Now why do you want this bipartite molecule? The reason you want it, uh, first uh, point here, is that fats dissolve in fats. And all cell membranes are lipid membranes. So you've got to have something fatty to get through that fatty barrier. Once you get inside, now that electrostatic charge, that positive charge will be uh, interacting with opposite charges which attracts. So a negative goes to positive and vice versa. Now in this illustration, the mitochondrion has a net negative charge and so this gets in there, it can block all that electron flow, no energy is produced and the cell dies. Same way with uh, uh, DNA, it can slide in between the rungs of the DNA ladder and, and you can uh, when the DNA unzips to copy itself, it breaks, and you have a mutation. Finally, the other ingredients can also break cell membranes, and that's another way to get into the cell and destroy it. So basically, what you have in any kind of pesticide is a molecular bull in a china shop with a mix of all kinds of different kinds of chemicals. Just as an illustration, we know more probably about Roundup than any other pesticide, and so I'm going to show you the different things that it can do. DNA damage, which can alter developmental patterns. Changes in aromatase, the enzyme that converts testosterone to est estrogen, which changes fetal brain and gonadal development, changing sexual preferences. Stimulates the retinoic acid pathway. That's too much vitamin A, and, one can, and, and it, what it can deduce is more birth defects. Altering mitochondria, which induces oxidative stress, which is the basis for all those chronic dis diseases. Shuts down the, the uh, amino acid pathway for bacteria, which is, means a loss of bacteria in the gut that you need for immune function. And used as a pre-harvest desiccant, it dries out uh, plants and sugarcane, and it's also used as a weed killer just before harvest. Um, there's both kinds of sugar and all kinds of grains, which is the derivation for white. Get the white out. Uh, environmental Working Group uh, published uh, a, a paper recently showing Roundup in all the oat cereals and Quaker and General Mills. And finally, Roundup ties up chelates. Uh, metal ions like calcium, magnesium, zinc, and copper. These are all critical for biological function, DNA function, and, bi and catalytic enzyme reactions. And if you don't uh, want to know about, more about this, just go to Google and 
and look for PAN glyphosate monograph 2016. It's got all this information and more. So you can find out all about this in great detail. And there's another reference there too. So the evidence is hiding in plain sight. You can check it out on Google Scholar. So what have we learned? The data suggests we may be sexually assaulting our children in utero, possibly altering their sexual preferences or aborting them prematurely. There is virtually no marketed pesticide formulation that's ever been registered by the EPA. That means we have no data on formulations. Registrations do not include tests for all of these things I've been talking about, so we don't have any data on collective sensitivity tests. And finally, the data for registrations, as pointed out earlier by Carolyn and, and uh, Melinda, is meaning that we're collecting the only data that's used in any of this registration is biased data. So we have to ask ourselves, can we afford to raise children of generations that are neurologically, endocrinologically, immunologically, and reproductively impaired? Can we afford to induce chronic, long-term, subtle diseases and alter genetic expression that may be passed to subsequent generations? There's plenty of data suggesting that now. One solution is to allow the illnesses to continue to accumulate until a breaking point is reached where the remaining population recognizes likely causes and decides to act. But another solution is change in market share. As Melinda pointed out, um, media is extremely important, but we need to have unbiased research because we need to know what the data really are. We need to get PGMO labeling going because certainly that will shift market share and it's why the industry has pushed back so hard on this. We need independent National Organic Standards Board and independent certifiers and there's been some problems in that arena too, thanks to USDA uh, uh, interference on some of these issues. And finally, we need very strong marketing campaigns as Melinda has pointed out. This is going to give us a rose that is going to ultimately lead to the change in market share that will come eventually. The only question is, how fast? So I'm often asked, Warren, don't you think things ought to go a little faster? When you're heading in on a landing for an airplane, you've got a, you're diving in toward the ground, and what the heck is going on here? And I say, well, I gotta tell you about Howard Harrison, because he was a famous airline pilot who had, was in the Vietnam War, he was an ace, and finally he quit and he decided he was gonna go and fly for a big airline company. And he was, had perfect landing patterns, perfect safety record. One year he said, I'm getting tired of taking your physical every year, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna do that anymore. And the doc was examining and said, you better do that, Howard, or we're gonna ground you and you'll never fly again. So he says, okay, I'll take your exam. And he went in, he took the exam, passed it with flying colors until he got to the very last exam, which is the eye exam. He could hardly read the E on the top of the chart. The doc says, this is crazy. You have this perfect landing pattern, perfect safety record, and you're telling me now you can't hardly read the E on the top of my chart? How do you do that, Howard? Howard says, it's easy, doc. I've been flying since I was 14. I get in the cockpit, get taxi clearance, taxi down the end of the runway, get takeoff clearance, Shove the stick forward and off we go. And I get up in the air, dial the autopilot, plane flies itself. And I get near the airport, I get on a glide path and I shove the stick forward and down, down, down we go. And the doc said, I know, I know, Howard, but why don't you crash? Howard says, it's easy, doc. You just keep going down, down, and down. And when the co-pilot says, Jesus Christ, man, I pull back. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Warren, and thank all of you. And we'll now be collecting your questions, so if you wrote down a question, please raise it up, and we have volunteers collecting them. And we'll begin with a question that I already received here, and this is to Warren. So if you could please elaborate on the lower you go, the greater the effect. Yeah. This is, this is a peculiarity that was known actually in the early 1960s. It came from endocrinologists. And um, I'll give you, we don't know all of the reasons for this, but there is a paper that came out in 2012 that explains it beautifully. 
and it's pretty involved, but I'd be glad to tell you later. But I just want to point out to you that a woman going through a monthly cycle starts with 40 parts per million estrogen in the beginning of the cycle. What that does is it totally inhibits the brain from releasing two key hormones that will cause ovulation to happen. As the follicle around the cell grows during the maturation of that egg, it produces more and more estrogen. So estrogen is slowly rising. So we're going from 40 parts per million, which is totally inhibiting the brain. And it slowly rises until it gets to 400 parts per trillion, sorry, 40 parts per trillion to 400. At that point, the brain completely re reverses the way it's operating in it. There's this big rush of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which causes the ovary to rupture and release the egg. And with that collapse of the surrounding tissue, it starts making less estrogen. And all of a sudden, now the brain again flips back and totally suppresses um, <clears throat> the uh, production of, uh, of uh, uh, LH and FSH. So it's an example of how going from one concentration to another, you can get the brain to completely reverse its response. This involves the number of receptors um, and a, a nonlinear response that they have. And I can show you some graphs if you'll come up and ask me about them, but it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenally interesting thing. And it, and it involves, oh, we're, used to, we're used to thinking about doors with locks and keys. That's the way we talk about enzymes. But now we're beginning to understand that instead of a lock and key, it's more like a doorknob. And the, and the, and the molecule or the enzyme has got to change its shape like the hand changes. So if I'm wanting to grab my left hand, or my left hand here, I can't do it with the hand open. But if I close that down slower and slower and slower, now all of a sudden I've got an, uh, a lock. And if I go even lower, now all of a sudden I can't even get hold of it anymore. And it's this kind of a shift, a, of a continual shift in shape, influenced by a, a number of variables that, that gives you these very peculiar uh, graphs. If you were to graph this, it'd be going slowly up like this, and then all of a sudden it'd just drop like that. Great. Thank you, Warren. You have a question here for Caroline, and that is, um, are pesticides filtered out of drinking water? And the person asking this was also interested in knowing, um, does New York City water have pesticides in it? Uh, I have not seen any pesticide testing of New York City water, so um, I don't actually have any information about that to share. Um, there have been um, studies of drinking water over the years, and typically when the most pesticides are found, um, it's um, in the Midwest, and um, cities that get their drinking water from um, large rivers that drain agricultural areas. Um, but uh, pesticides, um, yeah, I, I imagine that um, pesticides would be found regularly in um, many sources of drinking water in the U.S. Okay, does Melinda want to add? Yeah, I think if you go to the USGS um, survey, there is information on water testing. And what was really interesting to me when I looked at it was that the urban areas were not so different from the, some of the agricultural ones. Um, just because it well, could be lawn care, for example. Um, also, there was some work from Paul Winchester who spoke at the Beyond Pesticides conference several years ago who showed that birth defects were higher. This was in women in Indiana, but the Midwest. Uh, birth defects were higher in women who were who conceived in the early in the late spring and early summer months when some of the spraying of atrazine in particular was higher. So, great. USGS is a great resource. Thank you. And we had another question for Melinda here, which is, how much can we trust that organic produce is not contaminated? Well, I trust it. I think it's the best we've got. It's not, um, you know, there, everything is always needing improvement, and we need to be diligent and pay attention to what's going on with regard to policy. But 
all the data that I've seen shows that residue levels are significantly less with organic produce. And I think there was recently a, well, there was a video made on it, but it was based on some research that looked at, awfully loud, um, that looked at uh, herbicide residues in children's urine when they consumed an organic versus a conventional diet, and there was a significant change in pesticide metabolites in children's urine. So that's good enough for me. I only buy organic produce um, for what it's worth, and uh, organic and local together is even better. Great. Thank you. And I have a question here that any of the panelists feel free to jump in. And the question is, if EPA registration does not look at neurological, immune, or endocrine effects, what do they look at? Just carcinogenicity? What are they looking at? The question again is, if EPA registration does not look at neurological, immune, or endocrine effects, what do they look at? So I think we can take this broadly. Can you give a summary of what's being tested, maybe broadly what's not being tested by EPA when they register pesticide? So the pesticide testing um, process that uh, EPA asks the pesticide manufacturers to do um, is complicated. Um, and I, I don't think I want to, you know, run through all the details, but um, one really simple thing that's important to keep in mind is um, that most of the health and safety testing is done on what's called the active ingredient rather than the actual pesticide product. So pesticide products, um, they do what's called a six pack of toxicity testing. So it's like, um, how much does it take to kill you if you drink it, if you um, breathe it, if you put it on your skin? Does it cause eye irritation? Does it cause skin irritation? Does it cause allergies? But they're all like really short term. Um, so the, the sort of more uh, long term chronic diseases that I think most people are more concerned about, so cancer, birth defects, problems with the immune system, problems with the developing brain, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all just done on um, what is legally called the active ingredient. Um, so there's a huge gap in, in um, knowing, because what we're exposed to is the actual product. We don't actually know, we don't have the, or e at least EPA doesn't have the data to really evaluate that. Absolutely, that's right. And I think that segues very well into another question we got, which was, do we need a change in research? And I'll interpret that also as maybe how do you all envision that happening? Um, at present, scientists often look at an isolated substance, as Caroline is discussing here, uh, and not at interactions or full formulations. Um, so how can, I guess, you envision maybe shifting the way that researchers approach, um, even beyond EPA, uh, study of pesticide health effects? Go ahead, Carolyn. Okay, well, I'm just gonna throw out my little sound bite, which is, if we didn't use them, we wouldn't need to test them, right? So um, I, I think the pesticide testing process is actually unnecessary because we don't need these chemicals to grow our food or have a lawn or whatever. So in, in the big picture, um, I think we can just do without. Um, in, the, in the short term, um, it's really frustrating. Um, when I mentioned some of the um, long-term studies on farmers and farm workers, the reason that those keep uncovering these surprising facts is because these people have been exposed to these chemicals for decades. Um, and we should not be doing these kind of experiments on ourselves and our children and our friends and our families. Um, and that's why we're all here, right? So we can change that. Yeah. I did, I did. 
I'd like to tell you about a new technology that has been developed that can address that question of interactions and, and complex mixtures. We've done quite a bit of re research on mixtures over the years, and typically we've always found that mixtures have greater effects in terms of impact on the bio biological systems. But lately there's been a really exciting new development where for a single small sample of maybe 30 microliters of serum or maybe urine, uh, the biomarkers in that can be identified. And we've done research on well, at least, I think, six or seven major kinds of stressors now. And every single stressor we look at, especially the chemical ones, give us a different signature, a different uh, chemical fingerprint. And so it may be possible in the future to be able to, with a very simple analysis, uh, which takes maybe 15 minutes to do, is to, identify, is to fingerprint you for the chemical exposures you've had and how you're responding to them. It's a very exciting development, but it still, still has a lot of research to go to really clean it up. But um, we have seen major changes um, and the other interesting thing is that we're finding that different people respond differently to the same stimulus. Um, it's like playing the piano. Somebody will play a tune and play it slowly, and then somebody else will play it really fast, and maybe they play a little jazz in there too. And, and it turns out that because of the variation in our responses, uh, if you try to say one size fits all, it doesn't work. But when you begin to look at the individual variation, there's a lot of it, it's very rich. And, and uh, so this is gonna be, one of the things that pesticides are doing is it's really allowing us to understand how we function. But it's a heck of a way to do it by just simply experimenting on everybody and see what's happened. And I'll Thank just put a plug in for publicly funded research. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I think that's a great way of framing it though, that we don't need it and that we are the experiment, right, ultimately. Um, I think I'm going to pass this one to Melinda here. Someone wanted to know if the recent court cases against Bayer and Monsanto have affected your work and maybe communication around these issues. Do you see that as something that can be used to generate more positive momentum? Well, it's promising to see these cases won. It'll be interesting to see how much money is actually paid out to the victims. But these kinds of cases do set precedents, and I'll put a plug in for U.S. Right to Know because that is, if you want to keep up with um, messaging and uh, just some really great following of these court cases, I would rec highly recommend them. U.S. Right to Know. And uh, the two court cases where there's been a verdict so far um, have both been in California, and. Um, it's been really, really interesting for me to see um, since those verdicts um, were decided how many school districts in California have decided to quit using um, Roundup. Um, so um, there, there is a ripple effect that, um, um, I mean, just pains me um, to... Um, uh, for the plaintiffs in those cases that have worked so hard and been poisoned for so long and are so sick. Um, but um, if it can change the way that um, landscapes are managed, um, it, um, it, it will be a tribute to those people. Great. Thank you. Well, I think we're actually going to wrap up this section of the forum, but we're really excited to have you all here. And just as a reminder, our welcoming reception is going to begin in about 15 minutes at 6.15, right in here. And then we're gonna have an official welcome followed by keynotes starting at seven. So let's give an applause here to all of our panelists. Thank you all.